welcome to Senior Life Online, everybody. We're a nonprofit dedicated to the benefit of the health and education of Scotts Valley senior citizens. And we actually welcome people from all over the Santa Cruz area. I know we have quite a few members from up the valley and in town, so we're pleased about that. Today, we're welcoming Dan. Is it Dan Hapley? That's right. Excellent. Congratulations. <laughs> Hard one. Very good. Thank you. He's going to be talking, um, presenting Saving Our Shores and Creating Sanctuary. And uh, before he gets started, I will run through a few things about Scotts Valley Senior Life Association. And so. So let's see. Oh yeah, you sign up. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, suggest future projects. We do more projects. We actually are are uh, coming up on the Art and Wine Festival, the Scotts Valley Art and Wine Festival. So you can stop by and say say hi to us there. And uh, tax deductible donations are always welcome. We'll put them to good use. And let's jump to the next one, Maxine. Donations directly benefit senior citizens in Scotts Valley. A hundred percent or nearly a hundred percent of donations just go directly to benefiting seniors. We have virtually no overhead. And so uh, that allows us to provide extra extra great benefits. Uh, we also, if you're on Amazon, you can go use Amazon Smile and um, designate Scotts Valley Senior Life as one of your charities. We appreciate that. Especially nowadays, people are spending so much time on Amazon. I think we'd all do pretty well. And I can't read all the rest of that. Maxine's, <laughs> so let's just jump. So, and there's a picture of uh, most of our members. We don't have Jack in there. I'm gonna have to Photoshop him in there. But um, one of our members was kind enough to create a donation box for us. So um, when you see us at uh, community events, you may see our donation box. It's uh, a very nice one. And one of the things that we're very happy to support is the Scotts Valley Performing Arts Center. And uh, I know Dave has had a lot to do with that and it's really coming along nicely. It's adjacent to the Scotts Valley Public Library, uh, which is also undergoing renovation. But um, so that's gonna be an exciting venue for all kinds of entertainment. And there's a kind of a picture of it, what it might look like in the future. And this presentation will be recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, there are ways that you can opt out. So just let us know. But you can mute yourself. You can cut off your video so people can't see you. So um, that should be good enough. But um, And then, as I mentioned, today, Dan will be talking about Monterey Bay Sanctuary Creation, Manage Research, Community Education, and Resource Protection. And I'll tell you a little bit about Dan. Dan is, um, he has been just such an asset to the whole community. Um, Monterey Bay's, um, they, they just owe a lot to him. He's, um, Dan was the first executive director of O'Neill Sea Odyssey, and he was Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation Board Secretary. He's been a marine and environmental activist, playing key roles in many local environmental projects, including Save Our Shores, the Surf Rider Foundation, the Catamaran Literary Reader, and with U UCSC Professor Gary Griggs, published a weekly ocean column in the Santa Cruz Sentinel for many years. 
Dan's dedication to the preservation of our coastal treasures has earned him many honors. And we're honored today to have Dan Halfley with us. So take it away, Dan. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for that very kind introduction. I uh, know that I'm in very good company. I see that Donna Lynn just joined us and we have a number of community volunteers and elected officials here. So I'm very honored to be here and thank all of you for your service. Uh, I am going to talk about Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And as George indicated, I'm gonna talk about how we got it because that's a story of community involvement and what it does and how the community, how you yourselves can engage in the sanctuary. All right. So, All right, so today uh, we have uh, five national marine sanctuaries on the west coast of the United States. And if you look at the map in front of you here, the first one at the far, far north is on the Canadian border is the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And then jumping down to central California, we have the Greater Farallones National Marine Sanctuary from Santa Rosa, uh, basically the coast around Mendocino down to San Francisco. To the west and south of that, we have Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which protects, of all things, Cordell Bank, which is a very large rock formation, a great diving spot. Um, just south of that is Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which we'll talk about today. And then further south off of Santa Barbara and Ventura is the Channel Islands, National Marine Sanctuary. So these sanctuaries cover about 15,500 square miles or about 5% of federal waters. When I say federal waters, these are the areas generally between three miles offshore and 200 miles offshore. Um, and that's, it's known as federal waters for mineral rights, not necessarily fishing rights, that's another matter. So the rest of this area um, off the um, uh, U.S. Outer Continental Shelf, 294,000 square miles, was protected by President Obama from offshore drilling until the year 2022. Previously, poor, uh, George H.W. Bush, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, protected um, the West Coast. And it was actually his son, uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, did not continue that protection. It was up to President Obama to do that. Uh, he did put those protections in until 2022, but then President Trump reversed that uh, through some work with the, um, with the Interior Department and their planning process. So right now the area, the rest of the area is not protected from offshore drilling. And of course, as you know, California is already the third, third largest producer of oil onshore in the United States. So you think of Bakersfield, you think of San Ardo, you think of parts of Southern California, Steel Beat, um, you know, um, that's, that's, there's a lot of oil drilling in this state. In addition to that, we have a lot of offshore drilling uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel, of course, there are a number of platforms as there are off Huntington Beach, off Seal Beach, and off of Long Beach. So we are a contributor to the oil picture uh, throughout the United States. Closer to home, I mentioned before, we have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which protects 6,094 square miles. It hugs about 276 miles of coastline, uh, starting at Santa Rosa Creek in San Luis Obispo County, right there by Cambria. Uh, actually is at the very south end of town there and goes all the way up to Rocky Point uh, in Marin County. Um, the sanctuary at its deepest point is 12,743 feet deep, and that's in the Monterey Bay Canyon, which is off of Elkhorn Slough and extends about 50 miles offshore. Uh, the sanctuary also includes the wetland known as Elkhorn Slough. So Elkhorn Slough moves in about seven miles 
from Moss Landing. All of that is part of the sanctuary. The harbor though, Moss Landing Harbor, as is true with all the other harbors in the sanctuary are not in the sanctuary. That way the harbors can go about their business, dredging, et cetera. Also in 2009, President Obama at the behest of then Congressman Sam Farr uh, added Davidson Seamount to the sanctuary. So when you look at this map here, you'll see on the left hand uh, uh, corner down there, it says Davidson Seamount. Uh, this is actually an undersea mountain. It's about 75 miles west of San Simeon. It's 7,500 feet tall from the ocean floor to its summit. And its summit is still 4,100 feet below the water surface. So it's a pretty spectacular area, has a lot of coral reefs, um, you know, great fishing grounds, and um, a lot of research is going on there. It's, it's really spectacular find. The sanctuary includes a lot of wildlife, uh, 36 species of marine mammals, of course, including blue whales, humpback whales, gray whales, uh, sea otter, um, more than 180 species of seabirds, you know, about cormorants, pelicans, um, sooty shearwaters, uh, at least 525 fish species, of course, salmon, rockfish, and abundance of invertebrates and algae. Invertebrates you can find in the tide pool areas. And of course, algae, one good example of that are the kelp forests that we have, uh, which uh, do a lot of good for our coastline. Jack Dillis and I were just chatting about surfers off Pleasure Point. A lot of them are there in and around the kelp beds. So among other things, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary prevents offshore oil. That's the reason it was, it was uh, established. It also governs water quality in conjunction with the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, a board of which um, Dave Hodgson was a, a, a member, as a volunteer for many, many years and worked very hard there. Thank you for that. Um, it also protects uh, the coast and other, uh, the, the waters in other ways, uh, governs seafloor disturbance. So when you have underwater cables for telephone service, for example, uh, that's, you know, their attachment to seafloor is governed by the sanctuary. Um, it also protects maritime resources, including shipwrecks. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Of course, I mentioned offshore oil started the whole thing. And um, I think you can trace the thing back to 1969 with the Santa Barbara oil spill, the Union Platform A uh, uh, disaster that occurred really changed not only how offshore oil was conducted as a federal activity, but also changed the way people felt about the environment. Uh, and they did feel strongly about the environment as a result of this event because it was the first time an environmental disaster came into people's living rooms via television news. So you can trace back activism in the Monterey Bay area uh, there was an effort to establish a nuclear power plant at Davenport Landing, late 60s, early 70s. There was an effort to develop a deep water port and oil refinery at Moss Landing. Uh, these both sparked citizen movements. And also, also in 1978, a group uh, was formed called Save Our Shores. And the picture to your right here, this gentleman speaking, that is then Monterey County Supervisor Sam Farr. Uh, coming over to speak in Santa Cruz. This is at the Santa Cruz Harbor. Um, and uh, this was in 1978 and one of the early uh, proposals for federal offshore oil drilling. So Save Our Shores became an active organization in 1985. 82% of Santa Cruz city voters agreed to do two things uh, at the ballot box. They agreed to subject all onshore support facilities for offshore oils to a vote of the people. So um, pipelines or helicopter pads um, or dewatering facilities, any zoning changes for those would have to be approved by the vote of the people. The second thing that voters approved was spending some money to spread this idea around California. So voters did that by 82%. Um, Save Our Shores was hired to do the contract. I was hired as a coordinator. So, um, I managed to work with 26 communities from San Diego to Humboldt, Scotts Valley is one of them, to pass laws um, uh, governing onshore facilities for offshore oil. 
That slowed down, however, once the oil industry found out what was going on and they sued 13 of those local governments. The local governments won in court, by the way, but it cost a little bit of money and effort for them to do that. So in the meantime, this fight against offshore oil really dovetailed with efforts to establish a marine sanctuary here. So I mentioned this, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. In the wake of that, Congress approved a raft of laws, including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and also something called the Marine Sanctuaries Act. And the Marine Sanctuaries Act would establish national marine sanctuaries. And the first one was established in 1974, approved by then President Gerald Ford to protect the USS Monitor, which was a Civil War ironclad, uh, which was submerged and, and now has been, is no longer submerged but was a resting place for Civil War iron, ironclad monitor, which included some sailors which were trapped on board when it sunk back during the Civil War. Uh, also in California, voters approved Proposition 20 in 1972, and this was known as the Coastal Protection Initiative, which later established the Coastal Commission and uh, guaranteed public access or gave them the tools to fight for public access throughout California. So in 1976, Monterey Bay was nominated for marine sanctuary status by that coastal commission. And it was not successful in part because the fishing community was not on board with this. So this was a lesson to be learned by the folks who uh, uh, worked on the sanctuary at that time. 1976, US Representative Leon Panetta was elected to Congress uh, and in his time in Congress, one of the many things he did was to establish an annual moratorium on funding to support federal planning for offshore oil. So in order to lease federal lands to the oil companies, you have to have a planning process involve people, much like city as a planning commission involves people at that level. Leon would, would freeze these funds to the budget committee so that you couldn't run the Xerox machines, you couldn't hire staff to do all this. And he did this year after year after year, along with a, a coalition of colleagues from both parties all around the country, uh, members of Congress. Knowing that this wouldn't last forever, in 1988, he was also able to obtain authorization from Congress to begin planning for a marine sanctuary in Monterey Bay. Same time, something called the Environmental Working Group formed in 1988. Uh, I was co-chair of that in my role as Save Our Shores, also Rachel Saunders, of the then uh, Center for Marine Conservation, now the Ocean, and now they're called the Ocean Conservancy. Many organizations were involved with this, including Save Our Shores, Center for Marine Conservation, Surfrider Foundation, League of Women Voters, Sierra Club, Defenders of Wildlife, a group called Coastal Advocates, and Friends of the Sea Otter. So our mission was to get the largest boundary and strongest protections for the sanctuary. There were seven boundary options that were considered. The smallest was just Monterey Bay and the largest was known as boundary option five, which you see here in the picture, uh, which included um, most of the coastline from Cambria up to, um, up to San Francisco, basically having the Northern boundary of the sanctuary be co-located with the southern boundary of what was then the um, Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, now Greater Farallons. The idea was that most of the oil that um, was desired offshore uh, was in, in an area that was most accessible uh, from an area from Davenport north to San Francisco. So that's why we wanted to protect that area. To do this, we had to show the environmental working group had to prove that there was a continuous diverse ecosystem from San Luis Obispo to Point Reyes. Under the federal law that Congress passed, you can't just say, oh, it's pretty and we need to protect it. You have to show that you're protecting species that need protection and that there are unique attributes to this area. Uh, one of those attributes we found was a place called Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, which is north of um, Half Moon Bay very biologically sensitive area. And it's also an area that's very popular for field trips, not today, of course, because of COVID. Um, but this was one of the uh, arguments, one of many arguments we used in support of the larger boundary. 
We were also able to work off of some maps that showed the, um, the population densities of various species and habitats. This is before the days of laptop computers, basically. So a lot of this stuff was developed through studies. A lot of this stuff was done by hand and was compiled and sent off to Washington where two staff people in those days were working on NOAA. Poor folks had to sift through all this and put together an argument for the large boundary. We also had a political component. The Environmental Working Group organized people to participate in the process. There were four public hearings, Half Moon Bay, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and Sacramento. Uh, in all, about 4,000 people wrote letters, sent postcards, made phone calls, made comments, and attended these hearings. So, as though people needed reminding of the dangers of oil offshore, there were two oil transport disasters that happened in 1989 and 1990. The first was the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, which most of us remember over 30 years ago. And then the American Trader spill, which happened off of Huntington Beach in 1990. And this was because um, there was a break in the line between the tanker offshore and the, uh, the line that went onshore next to where the power plants are there in Huntington Beach. So um, this really catalyzed people once again, concerned about, and again, this is oil transport, not necessarily oil drilling, although there's still a danger from both. So in 1992, the political component of this was that George Herbert Walker Bush was running for reelection. And in those days, California was in contention for both parties, mostly for the Republican Party, uh, but he was behind in California. Um, at the same time, um, there was a, uh, a um, bipartisan group that wrote to President Bush, U.S. Senator Alan Cranston, Democrat, John Seymour, Republican, and Representatives Leon Panetta, Democrat, and Tom Campbell, a Republican, who all encouraged the largest boundary of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary because the public had demanded that. So guess what? It was an election year. Uh, he needed California. He got these signals. Voila. In 1992, uh, in June, actually, I was uh, actually at home. And I got a phone call from a reporter who said, what do you think of the president approving that large boundary for the sanctuary? And I said, what? So I drove to my office and in those days, you know, we didn't have internet or email, we had fax machines. Somebody had managed to fax me the press release that had been faxed from Air Force One. So there it was. And at the time, this was the largest marine sanctuary to be established. Um, the sanctuary didn't have everything the environmental community wanted. In fact, one member of our coalition went so far as to oppose the sanctuary and even convinced some environmental luminaries like David Brower and others to sign an ad in the New York Times saying, let's scrap the plan and start all over again. But the rest of us felt that we wouldn't have this opportunity again. So we convinced those who were nervous by seeing that ad that it was important to do this. Um, Congressman Leon Panetta went full speed ahead and got approval for this new sanctuary, uh, latched on to an approval for funding to restore uh, Florida after Hurricane Andrew back in 1992, and the sanctuary was designated on September 18th, 1992. So we have a sanctuary. What does that mean? Today, we have 21 staff that manage that 6,094 square miles, and they have a number of volunteers, and they undertake research, resource protection, and education and outreach. And I'm just gonna talk about some examples in each of these three areas. The sanctuary does a lot of work. I'm just gonna to touch on things that you may have heard about. So an area of research, uh, the first thing you may have heard of is the octopus garden. And uh, besides being the title of a lovely song written by Ringo Starr, performed by the Beatles, um, the octopus garden actually exists in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Quite, it was found quite by accident. In 2018, Chad King, who works for the sanctuary, was leading a team of scientists to go explore that Davidson Seamount that had just been added 10 years before. 
And uh, just as they were about to get there, they looked down and they were in 9,800 uh, feet foot depth of water. Are those octopuses down there? So they went down and take a look, over a thousand brooding female octopuses tucked in as though they were, um, they were brooding their eggs and they couldn't figure out why they were there. Um, there, there there's been evidence of warmer waters via thermal vents in this area, but that water could be too warm for octopuses. So they took some pictures and then they went on to do their research at David's Seamount and they went back in 2019 and took some samples and they're continuing to work on these samples today. But this was a startling find. Nobody expected to find such a species at this depth, at this location. And um, unveiling this, uh, the mysteries around this will be uh, quite illuminating, uh, not only for marine research, but for a lot of other efforts as well. Um, you know, the science of, of the ocean has a lot to do with the science of climate change because climate change, you know, when climate change occurs, excess carbon that's put out is absorbed by the ocean and it does have effect on the habitats and uh, marine life that's there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So all of this has an effect on other research that's going on. Um, the next interesting, a bit of research that's been going on in Monterey Bay and has been elsewhere is known as environmental DNA. So as we're walking down the sidewalk and we scratch the side of our face, we're gonna leave a little bit of DNA behind, you know, and, and police will tell you about the role of DNA. Well, when you're in the water column and you're a fish or you're a jelly or you're a microscopic organism, you'll leave behind pieces of organic matter. And this organic matter is going to tell you about who's been there in that cubic foot of water column. And it's gonna tell you a lot about the habitats in this area. Very helpful around Davidson Seamount, very helpful in the Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon where Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has done a lot of its research. It's located right there. Um, that's why David Packard founded it. And environmental DNA has been a real breakthrough um, you don't have to wait for that particular fish, spe fish species to come by if you have their DNA somewhere and you, you, can, you can try to match the species, there's a methodology for doing that. And so Monterey Bay is working with partners on using this as a tool. The last thing I wanna talk about is the USS Macon. So you see in the picture here, this airship, uh, the USS Macon was a US Navy dirigible. And in the 1930s, uh, mid 1930s, it was out over the Pacific doing surveys. Um, most people think it was out looking for Japanese subs, which were liking to take pot shots around those those times at U.S. oil tankers. Uh, it was coming back, um, and actually, I have uh, one of my early columns. There's some old film footage taken at Twin Lakes Beach of when the um, Macon was passing over Twin Lakes Beach heading out to sea was taken by the folks that live what's called Russ, Russ Rolf's house, the house at the very end of Twin Lakes Beach, which has recently been renovated. His grandmother took that footage. Well, they were coming back from their survey mission one night. They were coming back over Big Sur to go back to their port at Moffat Moff Field. And they ran into a storm they hadn't anticipated. And um, a cascading series of events caused the ship to buckle and to collapse. And, be, and the ship also, keep in mind, had a, in, in it some Sparrow Hawk airplanes. I mean, it was a loaded ship. So most of the crew managed to get to safety thanks to quick thinking by the captain and his crew. Unfortunately, two crewmen lost their lives. Uh, so now the USS Macon lies down on the slopes below Big Sur at a location that has not been um, disclosed because it's a burial site but research has been done there. Uh, I mentioned David Packard and Mabari. He took a personal interest in this subject. And it's a um, great example of the maritime heritage work that sanctuaries do, shipwrecks, Native American um, artifacts, um, things like the U.S. S. Macon, for example, the area around Ani Nuevo and uh, Pigeon Point back in the 1700s, uh, for example, you had a lot of ships that ran aground up there. You know, you didn't have GPS in those days. 
and you'd have foggy conditions. And sometimes, you know, you didn't have, people weren't at their best when they'd been on a long voyage. And there's some shipwreck sites up there. This is all part of maritime heritage, which is handled largely through the Channel Islands Sanctuary Office for California. A lot of fascinating stuff there, all under research. Education and outreach. So as you probably know, we have a visitor center in Santa Cruz. It's been closed because of COVID. It will reopen. Uh, in fact, the Sanctuary Foundation for which I serve as a board member uh, will be raising some funds to add some new exhibits there. Um, there's also a very lovely visitor center in San Simeon, right next to the pier there. If you ever go down there, um, it's a building uh, that's just on shore from the pier. And it's actually a partnership with state parks, which manages a lot of their, that area down there, including Hearst Castle. And these see lots of people who come through. I know the visitor center in Santa Cruz, you have people that visit the beach area in Santa Cruz, have no idea what a sanctuary is, come inside there, it's free look at some of the exhibits, learn something, learn about sound in the sanctuary, learn about the Monterey Canyon. Some of Gary Griggs's work on geology is in there. It's fascinating. And then for those people who don't go to physical structures like that, first we have something called Team Ocean. Um, in the bottom picture, you'll see a couple of kayakers and Elkhorn Slough. Uh, these are folks that actually get on the water and they serve as interpreters from the sanctuary. And we've been actually doing a little bit of that socially distanced during COVID, um, a little bit uh, around um, the area out of the Monterey Harbor and along Cannery Row, and then some in, um, uh, some in Elkhorn Slough, and we're gonna be bringing over to Santa Cruz at some point when it's safe to do so. And then a program called Baynet, if you look in the upper photo there, um, this is a, a program by which visitors this is again in Monterey who walk along the coastline there are stopped or can go up to a volunteer wearing a jacket and learn about sea otters or the kelp forest. And a lot of these folks are not from here. They have no idea. And it's a good way to educate them. And this is another program we'd like to pilot in Santa Cruz <clears throat> as well. And these are entirely, <clears throat> this is a volunteer operated program Lastly, resource protection, and this is fascinating. The first one, whale protection. So two of the biggest threats to whales um, along California are ship strikes and um, entanglement. Now, when you think of entanglement, you often can think of crab gear, you think of marine debris, and that's true. Um, so um, first, there is a matter of entangling whales that get tangled up. First we have to identify them. So we rely on boats that are offshore to, to let us know, to let the sanctuary know when there is a whale in distress. And then a trained veterinarian will go out and um, uh, uh, try a dart gun, which will contain some telemetry. Uh, so we can follow that individual. And uh, that's step two. Step three is getting the trained group out there, and this is intensive training. It's very dangerous work, and it requires uh, a lot of skill, as you can imagine. You can see in the picture here. Um, we haven't had uh, any major entanglement events so far this year, um, which is good. Um, but the Sanctuary Foundation does raise funds for the whale entanglement team. Another thing that's being done is an effort to prevent whale entanglements is work is being done thanks to a, a grant from the state of California, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary and the Sanctuary National Sanctuary Foundation are working on new fishing gear, crabbing gear <clears throat> that would uh, be less likely to cause entanglements. There are some issues with these and we're working closely with the fishing community. Number one is the gear would be very expensive. You know, it could be possibly a thousand dollars per crab pot more expensive than what they have now. So there's a lot of work that has to go into this, but there's cooperation across the board, which is you know, very satisfying for a lot of us that are involved in this. In the area of ship strikes where a large ship will, will strike a whale, a couple things are happening on that score. Um, Sean Hastings, who's in charge of this, works down at Channel Island Sanctuary, has been working with the Coast Guard and with some shipping companies uh, and there are also a couple of apps that they can use 
that indicate where whale activity had been most recently sited. So whale boats, the boats that will go out and do whale watching will use these apps. And his, that recent historical data is very helpful and probably reduces the number of ship strikes. We won't know for sure, of course, because you don't know what was prevented. Uh, it's hard to measure that, uh, but we're confident that it does have an impact. Lastly, I mentioned climate change. So all the sanctuaries along the West Coast have been working on a West Coast ocean acidification action plan. Ocean acidification is a, a scary term. Basically, it refers to the fact that ocean absorbs carbon and a, a um, chemical change occurs that ever so slightly decreases the pH of the oceans, uh, of the ocean. And uh, this can have over the long term detrimental effects. To combat this, the state of California and marine sanctuaries have been uh, looking at various ways to absorb excess carbon that's absorbed into the ocean. Seagrass uh, restoring kelp beds, and there's an effort right now by diving groups to try to restore kelp beds uh, around the Monterey Peninsula, which have been harmed by uh, urchin growth. And uh, many other strategies involve uh, sea level rise and involve other impacts of climate change. And of course, local governments are having to look at this as well. It's not only homes and infrastructure <clears throat> and roads, but it's other government in infrastructure, <clears throat> such as sewage systems and um, um, all, you know, water systems and all kinds of things that need to be accounted for. It's going to be a very expensive undertaking. So those are just some of the things that are happening with resource protection. Oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned snapshot day, Snapshot Day is an effort where volunteers will go out on a single day all around uh, the Bay Area to take uh, samples of water so they can determine where work needs to be done in the area of water quality. There also used to be something called first flush. <clears throat> so after the first rains to see where, uh, where contaminants have gone, uh, lately, the concentration has been on snapshot day, and this involves a large number of volunteers. And the sanctuary does keep data on what's happened uh, with those samples. So for information and to learn more, of course, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, their website is there. It's a government website on various tabs to learn about research to learn about education programs, to learn about resource protection, about whale protection. Um, there's also a link on the sanctuary uh, website to something called Simon, which is a database of all the research that's done by sanctuaries on the West Coast. Fascinating area if you have some extra time. Mentioned the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, which I'm on the board of. Uh, we're very lucky to have that board co-chaired by uh, Secretary Leon Panetta and former Santa Cruz Mayor Hillary Bryant. Um, we primarily raise funds for the sanctuary and its programs. We raise funds for whale uh, protection programs I mentioned before. Right now, we're also going to be raising funds for uh, an internship, for intern paid internships for underrepresented students to be able to work with the sanctuary. Um, we'll also be, as I mentioned, doing some work with exhibits and raising money for some other efforts around the sanctuary. And one of the things we do is we put on a Sea Stars brunch every year. We're going to be doing it on September 19th. Uh, the Monterey Plaza Hotel, we're keeping an eye on COVID to see whether the whole thing will be outside. Uh, last year, the Sea Stars brunch was virtual. So we're prepared for all options, but it's a great opportunity to raise funds. And we have some great sponsors for that event, PG&E, um, Santa Cruz County Bank, uh, Bay Federal Credit Union, um, Kaiser Permanente and others uh, are working, are, are supporting that effort. So I uh, just wanna close out with a thought from uh, one of our favorite marine biologists who lives in California, Sylvia Earle. She said, protect your life support systems as if everything you care about depends on it because it does. And really, when you think about the ocean, it absorbs carbon from climate change, as I mentioned, it provides half the world's oxygen. It's a major thoroughfare for getting economic goods around the planet through shipping lanes. Um, it 
controls weather and creates weather. Um, and it contains, it's the largest feature on earth. So it's something we have to take care of. So I am open for questions and um, thank you for your time. And I'd like to hand it back to the host. Well, thank you, Dan. That was fascinating. Um, I do have, I was wondering, you're talking about uh, coral and kelp and um, also I was wondering about sea stars. If the Monterey Bay Sanctuary is healthier than other areas in the world, I've heard the Great Coral Reef is, is uh, rapidly diminishing. Yeah. So how are we doing? Well, so the sanctuary does compare itself to itself every couple of years through something called a condition report. <clears throat> and the latest condition report showed that there was abundance of marine mammal and fish species, that algae was doing okay, Elkhorn Slough needed help because of the twin threats of erosion and climate change and um, uh, brackish water because water comes through the Moss Landing Harbor. Um, there were a few other issues. Compared to other parts of the world, um, the ocean um, is a large feature. Um, acidification is hitting it all the same. So a lot of the differences depend on conservation efforts. So I'd say Monterey Bay Sanctuary is doing pretty well. Um, is it because we have sanctuary status? I'd say sanctuary status tells us <clears throat> how it's doing, number one. Number two, it affords us to provide some protection where it's needed. For example, a couple of years ago, there was a boat that uh, went ashore near Seymour Center and that boat and that boat was taken care of by the sanctuary staff uh, working with the Coast Guard and other agencies in the Harbor Patrol. If that ship had leaked oil, as has happened in other cases, the sanctuary would have taken charge of that. And um, it does work to protect water quality, working with the agricultural community. So I'd say having sanctuary status has made a difference. And I'd say we're doing pretty well. It doesn't mean that we don't have threats and that we don't have a lot of work to do. Yeah, great. Excellent. So, anybody else have any questions? Um, yeah. I do, this is Jack. Hi, Jack. Hey, uh, thank you, Dan, for doing so much to protect our ocean and our environment. Uh, you have quite a quite a history of, of helping us. And uh, I've grown up along the coast. And I remember my dad being really, he got political around the issue uh, of saying, you know, of doing something about protecting, I'm sure you don't know him, but, but I never saw my dad get political before he saw the ocean was at risk and he got political. So I was happy to see that. <laughs> anyway, I'm Just wondering- running the family. <laughs> yeah, well, I care about the ocean too. I'm wondering about um, um, sharks. It seems like we hear more about sharks in the Bay. Do we have more sharks than we used to? We are seeing more sharks than we used to. We probably have more sharks than we had before. And this could be because of the warm blob that occurred a couple of years ago. And the sharks have come back, particularly around Sea Cliff. And we do see them and great whites are here. Um, there's an area called the Shark Cafe, <clears throat> which if you draw a straight line out of, off of Mexico, it's, it's where they, uh, they go to feed. And sharks have been uh, pretty active off California. So the answer to your question is we've been seeing more sharks and we probably do have more sharks. Mm -hmm. The research is not an entire, entirely agree, in agreement about whether there are more sharks, but we're certainly seeing them more. We're hearing more about shark attacks. Thanks. Okay, anybody else that wants to ask a question, be sure to unmute yourself. I have a question, it's Donna Lind. Hi, Donna. Hi, Dan, and, and uh, echo Jack's and George's comments too. Thank you for your life of service to uh, our environment and the ocean, so thank you. Um, I had you, I had another question, but the question on sharks came up is when I was in Hawaii, there was a shark attack off Maui, which was very, very unusual. And yeah. when I was there, there were a lot of rumors, a lot of things. And I never heard follow up on 
the thinking, you know, and that, you know, as far as that, that been an area that didn't see a lot of sharks and that change was something I always wondered if there was more study done and, and uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, this, they've been on the, uh, shark attacks have been on the upswing. I'm not familiar with the situation in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, there is a marine sanctuary there. There is actually a marine national monument and marine sanctuary. Uh, I can certainly follow up to see if I can get an answer to that question. What happened with this? This was how, about how long ago, Donna? Three years ago. Three years ago. It was right, okay. yeah, it would have been 20, yeah, 2019. Okay. And it, have, and it was actually in May of 2019. So it was okay. just, there was a lot of, um, a lot of attention, even military, they were flying helicopters over the, the beach and just uh, very different for that community. So was this a, was uh, it, did somebody, somebody was seriously hurt or died as a result? Yes. Yeah. They, uh, they were swimming off the Kanapali coast and uh, was attacked and died. And, and wow. it was closer to shore and everything, just very, very unusual, unheard of for that area. So um, my other is that I, I was actually born and raised on Santa Rosa Creek Road, but um, they had a couple years ago, were really dealing with some of the water issues more so because they were reliant on um, aquifers more than their sources were more limited. Right. And I've just Come wondered about Cambria, how that, right? yeah, Cambria, yep. Yeah. Hmm. And, and I just wondered about how that affected the sanctuary that when I was there for a, a reunion a few years back, there was a lot of concern about uh, climate change and the drought, you know, in that area, water resources. Yeah, and I believe they undertook an emergency desal project. Is that correct, Donna? I knew they had started it and I didn't hear, I haven't stayed in touch until you mentioned it. I knew they were passing some uh, ordinances to do an emergency. They looked at desal and they were looking at something else. Didn't know what they settled on. So they must yeah. have settled on desal. Yeah. Well, the potential threat. Just, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, just wondered the effect on the sanctuary from that, those actions. Yeah. So one of the big concerns is when you don't have rain flow, eventually when there is runoff, you, you, it can be very polluted runoff. So that's one concern. And another, of course, is saltwater intrusion into the aquifers as they get more and more impacted. And of course, that's an issue here. I believe it's more of a severe concern in Cambria as well. So um, I know that one of our Sanctuary Advisory Council members, PJ Webb, lives in Cambria and is very concerned about it and does report to us about it and what the community council down there is, is trying to do to keep the community in water and uh, what the community is doing to conserve water and also the impacts on the sanctuary. The two sometimes don't go together well. So I just, uh, you know, sometimes I think in the efforts to preserve water signs, the sanctuary takes a hit. So yes. that was my concern. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It really does. And, you know, the other concern is about that there aren't freshwater flows, salmon, fish, fish. You know, and and uh, the fisheries and wildlife agencies, both state and federal, have upped the ante in terms of what local government has to do to make sure that those streams are thriving and that fish populations thrive, and um, especially in the case of salmon. So, uh, lack of water is is a big concern for the sanctuary, and from that perspective as well. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Donna. Any other questions? Well, I have one more. This is Jack. Um, Dan, I was driving. Uh, we went down the coast a couple weeks ago, first time in a long time, down, down past Cambria, and we saw all the elephant seals. And yeah. there are so many of them. And of course, they were out there in the parking lot just and the beach just kind of floundered. And there were young ones. And they yeah. look like they're doing well. Is, are they a healthy population these days? They're a very healthy population these days. And when you see elephant seals like that on the beach, they look lazy. You have no idea that they can dive down to 6,000 feet and 
their their migration paths uh, would put any of triathloners among humans to shame. Um, but that population uh, is doing very well. Uh, that's known as the Point Piedras Blancas elephant right. seal area. And, and now that area is managed by volunteers at Friends of the Elephant Seal, it used to be that the elephant seals were everywhere and people were going right up to them and taking pictures. One person actually tried to climb on one's back. So <laughs> the uh, volunteer group raised the funds. They also got a national monument down there, which helped. And they raised funds to put that fencing up so people can observe them from a distance. Uh, my wife and I were just down there about three weeks ago and the males were there. They were molting, they were shedding their skin and they were also practice fighting yeah. for when the action would occur, which would be in a few months. Yeah, that was so fun. The population's the doing very, very well. Good, good. It was great to see them. Just really fun. Glad you got to see them. <laughs> yeah. So I imagine, what would you recommend if somebody wanted to volunteer to help out with um, certain organizations? Yeah, so there are, despite COVID, there are organizations that um, are operating now and some of them doing online work. The first, of course, is Save Our Shores uh, and that's saveourshores.org. Um, another one, of course, is Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation. Um, also, Monterey Bay Sanctuary, when the visitor centers reopen, the Santa Cruz Exploration Center, for example, they will be training volunteers once again to be docents there at the visitor center. Uh, there's also opportunities to be kayak docents with Team Ocean. Um, there are a number of other organizations in Santa Cruz, Watsonville Wetlands Watch. Um, there is um, O'Neill Sea Odyssey, which does an ocean program, as you know, which I ran for many years. They've been doing virtual programs largely because the population they serve, which is ages 9 through 12, are not vaccinated. Um, so they ceased doing, you know, kids close together on the boat um, when COVID hit. And they'll probably be going back uh, probably in the spring of 2022, but um, they're always looking for volunteers. That's O'Neill, seaodyssey.org. So there's a number of organizations that I uh, would love to have volunteers help them out. That's a great thing to know about for kids. Uh, are there age restrictions? Like if anybody wanted to volunteer? For volunteering, uh, there aren't age restrictions and they have, a very, they have various roles to play in volunteering. One of the roles when I was at O'Neill Sea Odyssey, one of the things we did is we had volunteers help out as chaperones. Um, and we had a lot of yacht people from the Yacht Club who were volunteers who did that. It doesn't mean you have to know how to sail a boat. It means you have to be on a boat with a bunch of kids. And if there's an issue um, with behaviors for one of the kids, which rarely happens, I should emphasize, um, then that's, that's something that needs to be done. Uh, they're really, they're looking for adults for that. Uh, but we've had kids come in and volunteer to do a cleaning day at the, uh, the education center. Um, the program itself, uh, it's a free program to the schools, but they all do a community service project, which is a volunteer activity. So the answer to your question simply is, no, there are not age restrictions. A lot of these organizations in general uh, don't have as many volunteer opportunities today because of COVID. For example, Save Our Shores and Beach Cleanups you know, people have to be socially distant when they're doing that. They are outside and there is distance between them, but you're not gonna see people doing a mailing indoors, you know, next to each other at a table, but there are still opportunities. Okay, great, excellent. And Louise Good had a question. Yeah. Hi, Louise. We can't hear you, Louise. Well, she put a question in the, in the uh, uh, chat section. Oh, I, I see this. Has COVID been discovered in the ocean? Uh, not, to my, not to my knowledge. So it would have to be one of the species that has had contact with another species with COVID. Um, not to my knowledge has anybody 
detected this. I could be wrong, but I have not heard of it. And it's something I, that we would think about. So I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Louise. You're welcome. Well, Dan, I always enjoy reading your column in the Sentinel. And between you and Gary Griggs, you're, you're my way of learning about what's really going on in our central coast, along the coast. And I, I really appreciate you guys keeping that up year after year. I'm sure it's a lot of work, but uh, it's very helpful to the citizens in general who, who don't have your breadth of knowledge. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Um, when I retired from Sea Odyssey, I handed that over to my predecessor, Rachel, who now she's no longer with Sea Odyssey. She continues the column and Gary certainly continues his. And uh, it, was, it was really fun to do, I'll just have to say. It was a really great way to keep up on what's going on because the ocean and the sanctuary are just vast subjects. And there are so many sub-subjects within those areas. You know, there's so many things to write about. When Gary and I started, he joked that we'll run out of things to talk about after six months. And <laughs> when I retired, we'd been doing it for 11 years. And it's going to continue on. So, you know, the more discoveries, and in, in I, I was able to really write a lot about what the sanctuary was doing in terms of research and resource protection. And there's just a wealth of stuff out there and people need to know, you know, the ocean is, you know, it really is our backyard. Um, and it's, it's, we are very dependent on it, not just the natural world, but economically too. It's, it's the major uh, through port for all, all of our economic uh, activity, you know, with uh, not only oil tankers, but cargo ships. And so um, the more we know about it, the better. So thank you for saying that. Well, this has been a very educational session. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, George Haas does a great job of organizing these videos because we recorded these sessions. And he puts them up on our uh, Facebook page. Uh, no, excuse me, YouTube, right? Yeah. George? Yeah. And, then, and Maxine makes sure that they're posted on our website. Uh, so if you have friends who would like to uh, 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 hear this session and feel like they, you know, they missed it, um, they can always go and, and look at the videos that uh, George has put up. Uh, the, um, the other thing is that we have uh, many of the former sessions uh, recorded. And so you can go to the website and look at those as well. It's a wealth of information on a wide range of topics of interest. Um, George, you want to take over? Yeah. And uh, just to follow up on that, I was thinking just while Dan was talking, my daughter and son-in-law are really into scuba diving. And uh, one of the things they're looking forward, they both live in LA, but one of the things they're looking forward to is the Monterey Bay. And I am gonna send them a link to this video so that they can see, because I know that they're really going to enjoy it. So okay. um, thank, yeah, thanks again, Dan. That was really excellent. And Next, our next meeting, we don't have a speaker scheduled yet. It's scheduled for September 6th. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll find somebody before then. A couple of things that we're planning to do is um, a live video presentation of the Performing Arts Center and uh, the progress they're, they're making on that. And uh, we're excited about that. And uh, also um, we have someone who's gonna be talking about social media and um, getting started on Facebook and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, thanks very much for attending everybody. And um, do you have anything else, Dave? Did I? Well, just, just mention the uh, Art Wine and Beer Festival coming up oh. next weekend. Um, and uh, that's just a few days away now. And we will have a booth there. Uh, so we'll be there handing out literature and talking to people about the Senior Life Association. And it's going to yeah. be a joint, it's going to be a joint booth with the uh, 
Scotts Valley Community Theater Guild, which is building the theater that George was talking about earlier. Um, so come by and see us. We'd love to talk with you. Yeah, come by and say hi. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Dan, again, many, many thanks to you. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Bye-bye now. Dave.